in the end that having to put everything through the bottlenecks of uh, conformity assessment bodies in the United Kingdom, which obviously are laboratories which do employ people and do work to a high standard, uh, the bottleneck was going to cause a huge amount of inefficiency in the economy and would, I think, would lead us to re reduced access to consumer goods or make them more expensive. That to me is a sign that, you know, that's almost justifying the Project Fair Remainer arguments from yeah. before leaving the European Union. Instead, we need to take a much more liberal approach to a product standard because actually, as many people rightly say, particularly the US, uh, the European Union has used the CE mark as a form of regulatory protectionism. So it won't add extra tariffs onto American goods, but it will use things like the CE mark or the REACH chemicals regulations to shut out competition from outside the European Union. The government's recent decision to continue allowing products with the European C mark and the delay of the additional water checks with the EU has been labelled by some as a Brexit climb down. This comes amid concern that amongst Brexit supporters that the government is really failing to take advantage of Brexit opportunities and meanwhile opponents of Brexit are saying it's delivered just increased costs with little actual benefit. Welcome back to the IA podcast. My name is Matthew Lash and I'm the Director of Public Policy and Communications here at the IEA. Each week, this podcast asks a tantalising policy question of a top political and economic thinker. Today's question, is Brexit being betrayed? To discuss, I'm very excited to be joined by Fred de Fossard, who is the head of the British Prosperity Unit at the Lagarde Institute, as well as a former Special Advisor to Jacob Rees-Mogg when he was Brexit Opportunities Minister, as well as Business Secretary. Uh, giving him an inside seat to the government's efforts to take advantage of Brexit, as well as reform government and the civil service. Welcome to the podcast, Fred. Thank you very much, Matt. Before we get to the bigger question of kind of the state of Brexit, I want to get your thoughts on these two recent government decisions mm. that I noticed you've been writing about. First of all, this question of the, the UK continuing to recognise the CE mark. Now, what does that actually mean, practically? Great question. And I would like to say I've actually been a qualified supporter of Britain's continued recognition of the CE mark. So the CE mark is uh, the Conformité Européenne, uh, which mm -hmm. is the product standard that the European Union uses to say that a consumer good is safe. Uh, before Britain joined the European Union, we had our own long history of conformity assessments. The British Standards Institute, which I think was founded around 1901, was providing the Kite Mark, which, uh, which was a private organisation, but it would grade products uh, to tell them they were safe for human consumption. Obviously, uh, as standards were growing, there was a great market incentive to get the British Standards Institute Kite Mark on your product. Uh, and then British Standard Institute was a world leader in showing that consumer goods were safe for use. When we joined the European Union, product standards eventually became part of the EU's regulatory responsibility, and the BSI, instead of being a sort of independent standard setter, became rolled up into the wider CE mark. The reason why this has become a slightly contentious issue is that when we left the European Union, the government decided that it would stop recognising the CE mark and instead restore a British mark, this in time called the UK Conformity Assessment UKCA mark. Mm. Where this was getting difficult is that the requirements to get UKCA uh, certification were almost exactly the same as getting the CE mark. It was not a more liberal regime overall. Uh, there were some tweaks, like a, a UKCA mark does not have to be physically engraved onto a consumer good, like a CE mark does, which does save some costs. But overall, it was very, very similar. So if you're selling a, uh, a good in the European market and the British market, your approval costs then just duplicate, uh, which is particularly important for the smaller, more specialist devices like medical goods. So yeah, I kind of started already noticing that you'd see a lot of goods, all sorts of goods from all, all over the world, basically just having a CE mark and then having a UK case um, CA mark already, yeah. um, which probably wasn't, it was probably in both cases exactly the same product achieving no particular purpose. Mm. Um, and then the complaints with business were, well, this is an additional cost for no benefit. But I think there's a kind of interesting consumer angle here as well, which is the big risk of ending um, uh, the recognition of uh, goods and aligned CE mark goods to be sold in the UK market would be basically British consumers could lose access to a lot of goods overnight who haven't bothered to go through the UK CA. Uh, process. Yes, I think that's true. And I think in the end that having to put everything through the bottlenecks of uh, conformity assessment bodies in the United Kingdom, which obviously are laboratories which do employ people and do work to a high standard, uh, the bottleneck was going to cause a huge amount of inefficiency in the economy and would, I think, would lead us to re reduced access to consumer goods or make them more expensive. That to me is a sign that, you know, that's almost justifying the Project Fair Remainer arguments from yeah. before leaving the European Union. Instead, we need to take a much more liberal approach to a product standard because actually, as many people rightly say, particularly the US, 
uh, the European Union has used the CE mark as a form of regulatory protectionism. So it won't add extra tariffs onto American goods, but it will use things like the CE mark or the REACH chemicals regulations to shut out competition from outside the European Union. So actually, UKCA was an opportunity to make a much more liberal, forward-thinking, pro-innovation, pro-competition mark. And as it was currently constituted in 2021 and 2022, it was not doing that. So that is why um, the recognition of the CE mark is in a narrow sense a good move for consumers. But I totally sympathise with the people saying this could be Brexit being portrayed. This could be wrapped up with, you know, chatter about the Windsor framework, putting the whole United Kingdom in regulatory alignment with the European Union. As I wrote for Conservative Home, I think it's essential that we expand the recognition further to demonstrate to consumers and businesses and also to Brexiteers mm. that this is an outward looking move. So I've recommended the best thing we could do next would be to expand the uh, recognition to all countries in the CPTPP trade agreement, which the United Kingdom has just joined. Yeah, so I mean, going back to kind of first principles here, which is uh, a good should be allowed to be sold on the UK market if it fulfills a high quality standard. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily matter whether or not that's, uh, I suppose, the EU's CE mark standard, the UK's uh, UKCA standard, which will continue existing and hopefully down the line become more liberal mm. in approach. But also by the same principle, there's no reason, for example, not to sell a good that was produced in Australia under Australian standards, which whilst not necessarily identical to the UK, um, are of you know high quality developed country standards. So this this is what um, Shaka Singham, one of our fellows here at the IA, talks about as regulatory competition. So you, you and which should encourage regulatory innovation, will give consumers more choice, push down the cost of goods. Um, I, I think in trade terms, we sometimes call this mutual recognition of standards. Mm. I mean, whatever kind of terminology you want to use, it's generally something that's kind of pro-competition, pro-trade and, and pro-consumer. Yep, I entirely agree. And if you look at some of the signatories, the CPTPP agreement, these are countries like Canada, Australia, Singapore, these obviously are countries with high levels of consumer products, high levels of consumer protection, mm. consumer rights, common law countries, sort of, you know, uh, countries which are very close to Britain and the British way of thinking. Uh, I think it's absurd to say that their products are, have to then go another round of uh, certification. And I think it would be a very good move for consumers to automatically say that you can get access to UKCA, if not de facto, then very, very cheaply. And it would help to increase competition and innovation. You mentioned mutual recognition. Uh, I think this is actually... Um, uh, we, we actually have mutual recognition agreements for product standards with Canada already, and I think with Japan. So like, it makes a nice, sensible next step to go further. But while mutual recognition is really nice, uh, unilateral recognition can be good too. There's this uh, problem, I think, in trade theory where everything has to be mutual and nothing can be unilateral. It's a little bit of a sort of tit-for-tat thing. So yeah. if they put burdens on, we'll put burdens on back. But in the end, the only people that pay is British people. Um, there is, I don't really believe in the arguments around leverage over this sort of thing. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is a shame the European Union has decided not to automatically recognise the high quality of British standards. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't um, recognise theirs if it means we can cut costs for British people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, perhaps not even trade theory, but trade lawyers. Trade lawyers see uh, trade agreements as tit for tat, while other economists can kind of see mutual, mutual benefit. Yeah. The other issue where this has come up recently about Brexit betrayal is this question of delaying the increased checks yep. on EU, particularly, I think, food imports. Mm. Um, and there was mentally, uh, originally meant to come in October, I think it's now coming in, scheduled to come in in the new year. This has been delayed multiple times. Yeah. What's going on with these EU border checks? So, very, it's a thematically very similar issue to the CE mark, but one which I think would have greater and more difficult political consequences. Uh, when we left the European Union, uh, we obviously had to develop our own border and trade policy, and that would include uh, SPS and veterinary checks and everything like that. It is obviously sensible for a nation to have its own properly functioning SPS regime. But... Tell us what SPS regime is. Uh, sanitary and phytosanitary... I, I, I know... Um, it's I've, a quiz, quiz here today go, at yeah, the yeah, indeed, yeah. Basically, basically food and agricultural imports Precise. for the most part, yeah. The issue we were facing is that uh, the Agriculture Department, DEFRA, and uh, along, along with HMRC, wanted to put a new regime in place, which would mean that all food coming to the European Union um, coming from the European coming Union. Coming from the European Union would have to have export health certificates attached to them, signed by vets. Export health certificates um, will cost around £100 per form. They would apply to the individual product in a larger, in a larger grouped lorry. Uh, and they would apply at different rates with different levels of risk to different products. So shelf-stable goods, tinned food, wouldn't have to have EHCs. But for example, cheese and charcuterie would. Uh, the issue is there is that 
if you're a cheese producer in France, or rather a cheese importer in England, you import loads of different cheeses in one lorry, because that's obviously maximum efficiency. If you were to have 20 different cheeses from France and Italy on your lorry, that means your lorry requires 20 separate export health certificates, so obviously at the cost of around £2,000 on top. Those export health certificates are not signed by the businesses, but by signed by vets in the country of origin. So already our trade policy is depend our border policy is dependent on the supply of vets in other countries and the working patterns of vets in other countries. It, it makes, so how could we even know? It makes you wonder whether DEFRA is perhaps run by French vet lobbyists or well, something along those lines. Very, very, very true. And actually put yourself in the shoes of a French vet. A, you're not going to work the sort of hours which means you might have to verify a shipment leaving for the United Kingdom in the middle of the night. B, your time is much better spent looking after dogs and horses because that pays a lot better than signing export health certificates. Um, so it was this it was potentially disastrous situation which um, wouldn't necessarily have led to checks at Dover because the government rightly said they would always be very light touch when it comes to the checks at Dover, but it would have led to nothing arriving at Dover in the first place. And I do think if, it was, if this was implemented as they were planning, we would end up seeing um, you know empty shelves in branches of Waitrose, nice leafy delis. It's literally writing Lib Dem leaflets for them. Yeah. Um, and it would be important, and the government would essentially be in this position of saying, I'm sorry, you can't buy this Epoise and you can't buy this Parma ham because of Brexit. I mean, yeah, it, it seems uh, kind of, again, just going back to first principles here, an absurdity on the face of it, which is what, what problem are we trying to solve here? So yeah, in, in theory, the problem you're trying to solve here is high quality food standards. Yeah. But what we have to ask ourselves, is there currently a problem with food imports and let's say cheese imports coming mm. from France that would justify all these additional checks? And to me, at least the answer is no. Yeah. There, there, there doesn't seem to be, you know, I, I literally I know about you, but I have not heard of one case, literally one case post Brexit of a low quality EU food product coming in because we're not doing all these kinds of checks. Exactly right. Um, it's worth remembering that we have been importing these without checks for about two years since leaving the European Union with no worry. I would have thought that's a great opportunity to use that two years of evidence to say actually we can have a much more liberal system based on risk and target the risk accordingly. I've been reviewing the Food Standard Agency's website to look for reports and uh, events of these sorts of um, problems because you know for a fact if there were problems they'd be hung around Brexiteers' necks, they'd be hung around Jacob Rees-Mogg's neck for example because <laughs> he was the biggest critic of these import checks. Yeah. But instead it hasn't happened. The one time there have been some contamination recently has been some deeply criminal activity around illegally imported pork. That would have nothing to do with this regime and the Food Standards Agency in DEFRA would be far better focusing its resources on those parts of the, yeah. the, the food supply chain, not the very low risk stuff like this. So again, and not imposing these checks is a, is a significant benefit for British consumers. And so the government's delayed the imposition of these checks on, on a more short term basis that would mm. be inflationary coming up to Christmas, but by the sounds of it there isn't really an argument to introduce them ever, that, that we should basically keep the status quo. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, the Chancellor was correct to intervene on uh, anti-inflationary uh, anti reasons, but I think we need to use this delay to go one step further and develop a more intelligent system. Uh, DEFRA's proposal for a trusted trader system for plants was actually, and plant-based produce was actually really good. Um, it meant that importers would not have to have a vet to sign their um, uh, export health certificates. They could sign them themselves, therefore reducing costs and actually making it worth your while to be on a trusted trader scheme. This did not apply to the animal and you know, meat and dairy related thing. I think the best thing you can do is expand that more liberal trusted trader regime to the uh, to the animal produce one, and then you have a much more intelligent led. Uh, data-driven trade border. Like the government does have a policy called the single trade window, which is like a data platform in which you can eventually digitize our entri an entire trade border. If this comes off, it could be an incredibly exciting, genuinely like innovative legacy of Brexit, and it would be the world's biggest single trade window. Smaller ones exist in like Dubai. Um, this could be an incredible policy to deliver as long as we take a very robust attitude to risk and actually based on real world evidence, not the hot, old like EU hazard-based approach. Yeah, I mean, st stepping back again and looking at both of the UK CA issues, as well as the um, border checks issue. Mm. It seems like the UK is kind of has a choice about not necessarily whether or not Brexit is being betrayed or not, but like what Brexit means in practice. Yes. So to me, at least, Brexit was always, I suppose, an institutional change, which is to say it, ch it changed who could make the decisions about things like UK trade from yep. being a competency of Brussels to becoming a, a competency of Westminster. Now, for a lot of free marketeers, the hope is then uh, well, that you use an opportunity to liberalise all these things. Mm. For another set of people, this was an opportunity to go down the opposite path, which is to uh, shut down uh, certain imports of certain goods yeah. and put up tariffs and put up barriers. You know, this is the question of does Brexit mean, and, and I suppose, a, a global Brexit vision or, or a, a more parochial Brexit vision closed to trade. Mm. It seems by it, partly through necessity more than through any kind of intention that we're now got, we're realizing that for all practical purposes, if, if 
you're going to make a success out of Brexit with it on these these kind of issues. Mm. You do need to go down that more open vision where you are have to continue trading with the EU, not to the exclusion of the rest of the world, but in addition to the rest of the world. I do agree with that. Um, I and mean, I, I agree it's um, now happening more by necessity than by design. Um, the fact that the government has accelerated our accession to the CPTP agreement is a brilliant win on this run. And it was uh, the IEA and the Gartam Institute who were long campaigning for Britain to join the CPTPP where many people said it was a ridiculous idea. Yeah. Uh, this could be a really, really transformative trade agreement which not only increases access to products and services from around the world but also helps to improve our regulatory environment as the, as the consequence of that trade agreement bed in and our centre of gravity moves away from uh, the European Union towards the, uh, the faster growing economy around the world. The Tory party itself is, as we know, fundamentally divided on this issue. Um, Brexit, as you said, was a, a decision about where power lies. It was a constitutional vote, in my view, and about um, who runs Britain. Uh, now Britain entirely unambiguously runs herself. We need to work out what that sort of vision is. So the, you know, the, the fault line within the British Conservative Party over um, largely you know, one nation versus Thatcherite still exists. And it's important for the Thatcherites and the market liberals to make their arguments and hopefully win. I'm wondering, even zooming out a little bit further here, what you make of the government's kind of overall success and failure when it comes to, to Brexit. You know, we're now a few years after the, the formal exit. We're now you know, more than half a decade since yeah. the vote. You know, has, this, has the, the Brexit been a failure or success in, in your view? Uh, obviously, it's too soon to tell, as uh, <laughs> yeah, as the Chinese premier once said about the French Revolution. Um, <laughs> but I think the I don't know. I think so. There have been some specific, discrete wins and policy successes, which will bed in in the future. So we have finally put the Financial Services and Markets Act into law, um, which is moving away from Solvency Two, Mifid Two, I think, uh, but other a number of um, heavy European Union regulations to our financial services industry. For example, allowing pension funds to invest in UK domestic assets much more easily. Yeah, exactly. Some of this is regulatory change which is really good some of it will have will, will take place after cultural change beds in but we've got to make sure our regulators domestically the F, the financial conduct authority and the prudential regulatory authority are as up to speed with taking a more innovative pro competition risk approach as we would like to see so the prime minister has was uh, was really really drove those financial services reforms and that's really good obviously the ability to move outside the european union's uh, like process based clunky procurement uh, regime is another bre- the success of brexit but ultimately instead of being a, a, like a visionary uh, re-engineering of our regulatory system. Instead, we've ultimately seen these piecemeal little bits and pieces. Um, Boris Johnson commissioned uh, those MPs, uh, Theresa Villiers, IDS, and George Freeman, to do the TIGA report, Task Force on Integration, in, 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 Innovation, Growth, and Regulatory Reform. That was published with great fanfare and was full of 100 or so really good ideas. Not all of them were entirely Brexit-related, but they were a good package of deregulatory reforms. It's a bit of a tragedy that I think only about a third of those ideas have been implemented, and especially they had the prime ministerial endorsement, but it's never, it hasn't really come to anything. So I think the Brexit opportunity story is not necessarily one about total betrayal, but more a case of not really knowing what we wanted to do, and a Whitehall machine which was, if not objective, ideologically resistant, but was just always finding ways of going slow, uh, another round of consultation, another round of risk mm. assessment, and not seeing a greater opportunity in front of us. It often feels like there's a lot of institutional inertia, yes. e- 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 either for ideological reasons or, or purely just as a way the civil service operates, and, yep. and you've well, been a lot closer to this than me work trying to work through these issues. But you know, you have you have a load of good ideas floating around mm. um, for things that you can do from, from together. You know, we we've got a list of IEA reports on things like net neutrality and cultivated meat yeah, and all, all, yeah. all the all these different kind of interesting ideas that um, in theory the government should be gra- grasping onto as great reforms to boost the economy and take advantage of Brexit. Yeah. But they kind of go into the machine and and from at least from the outside perspective, nothing seems to happen. Maybe there is some activity within the inside, and there are some reports being written that yep. don't get released publicly. And you know, there's there's views are taken from different departments, and ministers are consult. Maybe maybe it reaches Miss. I don't know. I, it's just like what happens when to <laughs> these ideas? It's, it's totally true, and I think you're you're right um, to say this from an outsider's point of view. Uh, to return to our first topic of conversation, the CE mark. Um, there was a very good paper written by the IEA's Victoria Hewson, who is now a special advisor to Kemi Badenoch. Uh, And she wrote this paper in February 2022 saying we just need to do the unilateral recognition. It will cut all these costs. Um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the minister I worked for at the time, said, yes, we need to do that. 
that was February 2022, mm. and now it's August 2023. So, well, that's one year and six, let's say 18 months later, um, this policy has finally happened, and it barely even required like a significant law change. So it does give you an, an indication of how slow things happen. Um, and it's sometimes hard for ministers to keep reassuring uh, Brexiteers on the outside that things are motoring along. But then that's the civil service process for you. If a, if a minister isn't emphatic immediately that we are doing this and we're doing this now, things will get drawn out through months and months of submissions, reiterations, consultations. Uh, and by the time you finally got your thing out at the end of the sausage machine, it doesn't look anything like what you put in in the first place. What, what kind of reforms could fix that? What, what need, you know, how can the civil servant... So it, I think we were talking about before we started recording that you know, sometimes, for example, when the Treasury turns around to a department and says, mm. actually, that's not a particularly good idea to spend $30 billion on a, on a bridge to nowhere. Um, you, should go yeah, do true, something, yeah. you should go do something else with that money. You know, sometimes institutional restraints are necessary within government yep. to stop departments from making silly decisions. But at the same time, those kind of restraints seem to hold back also making good decisions mm. or, or potentially beneficial reforms. I think one thing I learned from my time in Whitehall is that if something has a prime ministerial backing or treasury backing, it will happen. Uh, and it will happen pretty rapidly. Uh, if it doesn't have either of those two of those things, obviously ideally both, it is much harder because you have line departments who fight over their fiefdoms with each with one another and they will use process. There are many processes in Whitehall to frustrate reform. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily a case of like the politicisation of Whitehall against conservatism and against Tory ministers. There might be a little bit of that at the margins, but overall it's this overwhelmingly frustrating process of approval. Uh, we have chopped and changed our government structures hugely. We know we've changed departments and renamed them, put the responsibilities around in other places. While it might be, while we wouldn't necessarily design our Whitehall structure from scratch as we have right now, when you rename departments and change responsibilities halfway through a parliament, I think we'll probably spend the rest, entirety of the rest of the parliament sorting out the administrative consequences. Everyone will still have their old email addresses, and there's, and then they're all of a sudden the Whitehall is spending their time and money. Uh, focusing on how to reorganise two departments instead of doing more policy. Uh, cabinet approval uh, could definitely be improved. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I suppose, these are longer, longer term ideas for reform, along with improving the incentive structure for around Whitehall so you can actually empower people that do good work and also, crucially, make sure people that don't do good work leave the civil service, which at the moment is very hard to do. Uh, I'm interested what you said of the people on class was the other end of this debate, whose genuine real belief at this point, and you know, perhaps not completely evidence-free, which is that Brexit has been a disaster, yeah. it's added cost to British businesses, um, we're not seeing any meaningful benefits of it, mm. um, it's a key reason why the UK economy is struggling so much, uh, you, it's, it's quite clear to, I think, a lot, not indecent number of people, and in fact when you do public polling, about whether or not people think Brexit has been a failure or a success. There's, there's probably growing numbers who do think, mm. and along this view, that it, it has achieved nothing, that you know, we've got these big promises about how it would improve Britain, but where are we today? As you've said, a few peaceful changes here and there, a few nice trade deals, but yeah. um, on the other hand, bigger costs for trading with the EU, mess over Northern Ireland, all, mm. these, all these other kind of costs in, in the equation that, that don't seem to have justified the decision. Yeah, I think, uh, and I share many of their frustrations. Um, although one thing I would say is that the uh, you know the, uh, the fact that Britain continues to avoid recession while the eurozone remains in recession, Germany in recession, Holland in recession right now, um, and the fact that Britain was the fastest growing G7 country out of 2022 suggests that the, there's clearly a much bigger picture going on uh, than just uh, than whether Brexit has killed economic growth compared to Europe. It clearly hasn't, um, and I think many of Britain's uh, problems lie more at home rather than our relationship with the. EU, uh, the you know the tax burden is as high as it basically ever has been, uh, and get and increase and continues to get higher. We haven't wrestled with the demands that are changing demographics placing on the population. Uh, we have an immigration policy which doesn't seem to increase GDP per, per capita and productivity. We have re a real resurgence of long-term welfare uh, dependency following the pandemic. None of these things really have anything to do with Brexit. Um, I think Dominic Cummings was always right when he said that. Brexit was the necessary trigger to create the reformed state that we need. We just haven't done part two yet. Maybe part two is impossible. Maybe part two is very difficult. After all, the Tory party as an institution did not want to do Brexit, realistically. It was sort of forced on it by, uh, by the voters. And, it, and then Boris Johnson kind of forced it on the rest of the party. Mm. Uh, and the party hasn't quite come to terms with that. So it's, 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 a, it's a very difficult process. Um, but I, I have to say I'm sympathetic to people that say it isn't turning out brilliantly right now. Well, putting aside, uh, and it does seem, at least for now, that it's it's done as a political yeah. issue. What what can be done now um, to make, I suppose, a success? What what would, what's on your mind in terms of what would deliver growth for the UK, both into, I suppose, 
both in terms of Brexit opportunities, but uh, mm. broader prosperity as well? Oh, it's a great question. So I think, uh, yeah, unrelated to Brexit, first of all, I think we have to look at our um, ridiculous uh, taxation system right now. Uh, it's not just that taxes are too high, it's that the incentives don't seem to work anywhere. Um, as I was speaking to a, a Wall Street Journal writer recently, um, just look at the way we tax dividends so aggressively to deter investment. In the end, that's why pe British people spend so much money on holidays, because uh, that's one of the areas where they can spend money without being taxed appallingly. Obviously, the decision, you don't make the, the two decisions to do one or the other, but our incentives are structured in a way away from investment. Uh, we've made it, we've increased the tax on dividends even more, so why would you, why would you invest in more in, in private businesses? Uh, the changes to the capital allowances are good, you know, full expensing, making it easier to run right off um, uh, capital investment against corporation tax, but that's been rather clobbered with an increase in the headline rate. Uh, the Tax Foundation has a model of tax competitiveness, and they said after the budget, Britain's tax competitiveness declined, even though they're one of the biggest advocates of full expensing. So we need to have a greater focus on uh, on competitiveness, iron out the dodgy incentives within our uh, income tax system, realistically uh, work out what to do with national insurance, whether it's time has come as a tax entirely, uh, and finally come to a more sensible approach to taxing land and businesses as opposed to council tax and business rates. But then when it comes to Brexit, there's a bigger... There's a bigger philosophical issue, um, particularly around regulation. Um, there are, you know, specific regulations I would lift, particularly around the use of uh, the use of data, which has become a great, uh, great constraint on our tech companies, on AI, but also on small businesses that now have to apply by ridiculous data collection standards as if they were like a bank or, or, a, or a multinational. The, the GDPR issues. Absolutely. Yeah. But then bigger than that, it's a, it's a philosophy of regulation. Um, Britain has a common law legal system, which ultimately is more about outcomes than process. We have unhappily adapted the EU's process, risk, ha process and hazard-based regulatory approach uh, to Britain. We have an opportunity to move away from that hugely um, by ensuring the the courts can enforce good outcomes rather than regulators and civil servants applying tick box regulation. Um, the, common, the advantage of the common law system is it allows greater levels of innovation and competition. Think, say, new products um, if we were moved away from the EU's approach to doing chemicals regulation. Uh, because if your, if your outcome is ultimately to provide a safe product rather than a product that ticks all these boxes, you're necessarily going to invite more competition and more innovation. Uh, that has uh, longer term benefits to the economy, but it also reduces the size of the state because the state is required to do less monitoring and less enforcement and less process-based work. Um, these things are kind of hard to sell politically because they don't have immediate benefits. Um, the, long, the benefits of being outside the European Union uh, as a approach to ever closer union is a good one, but its benefits still will take a little bit of time to feed in. It's a little bit like the old arguments around free trade versus protectionism. Protectionism provides very focused benefits to uh, potentially politically important people in certain industries, in certain sectors, in certain parts of the country. Free trade benefits pretty much all of us, but in a more diffuse way. So in aggregate, the benefits are much greater, but, the, um, but because they're spread out, you don't necessarily have a winner cheering aggressively as you might have a loser shouting angrily. Well, hopefully we can be the ones cheering aggressively for yeah, exactly, yeah. a, a different, different approach that benefits consumers, encourages innovation and delivers uh, economic growth. Um, thank you so much, Fred de Fossard from the Legado Institute for joining the IA podcast today. If you are enjoying the podcast, please do subscribe on your chosen podcast writer or on the IEA's YouTube channel. And if you'd like to learn more about the IEA and read our recent publications, just visit IEA.org.uk. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.